start today by um, telling you how the program will go. Um, first, we're going to look at the U.S. perspective um, when advising lawyers abroad um, whether or not to waive extradition to the United States. Um, and we'll hear the reasons why waiver might be beneficial um, when you come to the United States. And we'll also hear um, the other side, when you might want to fight extradition, when that might have value um, to the individual who's been arrested. Um, we're going to hear um, from uh, Heidi, who's going to tell us about a number of individuals that um, have been arrested in Spain, often when they're vacationing. Um, so they're not necessarily Spanish nationals. Um, and how he deals with these extradition cases, both to the U.S. and also within the EU. Um, uh, Soren is going to tell us about um, a similar perspective from Germany. Um, and between Soren and Rebecca, we're going to hear how Brexit has somewhat changed the framework of how individuals are extradited to and from the U.K. Um, because they're no longer part of the EU extradition treaty and there are advantages and disadvantages to that as well. So we're going to jump right in with Lisa. Um, Lisa, can you tell us why um, an individual who's been arrested outside the United States for extradition to the United States might want to waive the extradition proceedings entirely? Sure. Um, let me just say as a starting point that I'm talking this morning about the Martyr Society extradition case where, I hate to say this, but my understanding is that you're probably going to lose. And at the end of the day, uh, the United States is going to get your guy or gal. So looking at it from that perspective, your primary consideration, knowing that ultimately the government is going to get them is their liberty. And ideally, are you going to be able to get them home while the United States uh, case plays out? Um, and the good news is that you'll see in the material, you actually have leverage because anyone who's dealt with extradition proceedings in this room knows they're a real pain for the government. They have to get counsel, it's a headache, and having indicted the case, the government is hot to trot. So if you are prepared to waive extradition, they are prepared to give you something. And uh, you'll see in the materials, they frequently will agree to favorable bail terms, where not only is your client free and in a better position to help you navigate the case, but they may be prepared to let your client return home. And that's obviously beneficial for a number of reasons. I represent Andrew Pierce, who's one of the investment bankers in the Mozambique uh, tuna bomb scandal. Andrew waived extradition in 2019, pled guilty. He has not been sentenced yet, but he has not spent a day in jail. And he's been in England back home for the last four years. And that's in large part because he decided to waive extradition. Now, even if your client is from a country that does not have an extradition treaty, um, they, the government will give you, they, they'll almost be more willing to give you credit for voluntarily surrendering and appearing in the United States. There's a case in the material of a Swiss citizen who was indicted. He easily could have given the middle finger to the United States and spent the rest of his days in Switzerland, but he'd obviously be landlocked and in Switzerland, and that wasn't an attractive option for him. So he came to the United States voluntarily surrendered, and the government agreed that he could return to Switzerland. So you'll also see that typically when you reach a deal with the government, the judge will almost invariably go along with that. Um, and to be clear, 
these cases that I'm talking about involve typically white collar defendants who have the means to post collateral for their bail. We're not talking here about other cases where someone doesn't have those resources. And it's obvious that you really need that collateral to be able to get the bail. <coughs> now, why have I started with the bail conversation? There are three primary reasons, one of which may not be obvious to European practitioners. And that is that most of the white collar cases that you're seeing here out of the states originate in New York. Well, the most, one of the most notorious federal facilities in America is in New York. It's the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. And pre-trial, everyone goes to the MDC. That means drug dealers, gang leaders, and your clients, the white collar defendants. And it is literally third world conditions. So it, you want to keep your client out of that facility at all costs. Number two, for the lawyers representing the individual, the MDC is an absolute nightmare. It's very, it's very difficult to get in, it's inconveniently located, there are lockdowns, so you're really um, handling the case with one hand tied behind your back if the client is in the MDC. Um, the, um, the third reason is that it's not the case that your client gets indicted and you're looking at a trial in three months or so. <coughs> the process can take months, if not years. And if your client is stuck there, um, heaven help you, it's just disastrous. So bail is really a uh, very, very powerful incentive to win. Now, if you're going to cooperate, you can also expect to get mighty credit for the waiver at sentencing. And the reason is we're increasingly seeing in the United States that criminal frauds are international in scope. And the judges are extolling waiver, uh, waivers at sentencing saying, we want you international bad actors to know if you stick up your hand and do the right thing, we are going to give you credit for that. So there is nobody in this room probably who has seen a cooperation deal go awry. If you're cooperating and you're waiving extradition, it's almost a guarantee that you're gonna get credit for it. Now, if you are waiving but you're not cooperating and you're merely pleading guilty to the charge, you can also expect to see some credit, maybe less, but some credit for your cooperation, and that's under the sentencing guidelines. You will get an extra level for acceptance of responsibility in addition to the standard two levels that you get for pleading guilty. And lastly, if you're waiving extradition, um, but your plan is not to cooperate, not to plead guilty, but to fight the charges, well, obviously, first of all, you're much better equipped to fight the charges if you're out of jail than you, than you are in jail. And there's a case that may or may not be familiar to people in the room. I think the name is Richard Unger. It's in your material. Um, he was indicted. He's a Brit. Uh, waived extradition, was able to return to the UK, actively assist in his defense, and he was acquitted at the end of the day. So obviously, um, you can ask yourself, would he have seen the same outcome if he'd been defending himself and working with his lawyer from the MDC? I doubt it very much. The um, counterpoint to that is a famous fit case that's ongoing in the United States right now, Samuel Bankman Freed, which uh, everyone in this room is probably familiar with from the FTX case. Freed was remanded and has been in the MDC. The case, the trial has obviously started, but pre-trial, he was stuck in the MDC 
and every day his lawyers were crying about how can we possibly prepare for trial? We can't have access to our client. Anyway, that's the counterpoint. But for all the reasons I've said, I think there were very, very powerful incentives to waive extradition. Lisa, given the importance for your, for your client um, of avoiding pretrial detention, um, what ability um, do individuals abroad have to negotiate with federal prosecutors about um, getting bail and getting assurances of having bail if they waive extradition? Isn't it the case that sometimes federal prosecutors say, waive, and then we'll talk about bail when you get here? In my experience, we've been able to secure, I, I'm referring to the Pierce case, we've, we've been able to get the government's agreement before we pled guilty. And frankly, without that agreement, the decision might have been different. Thank you. Um, Florian, can you tell us the reasons <coughs> and benefits why an individual under extradition may choose to fight extradition? Good morning. Uh, thank you for um, having me here. It's, real, it's a real pleasure. Um, first of all, as a general matter, I would say that I, and I think most American lawyers that practice in the exhibition space would agree with Lisa that as a general rule of thumb, waiving extradition and trying to negotiate um, uh, from, a, from a position of strength uh, is probably the way to go. Although you may have noticed, uh, and Lisa mentioned this, uh, and that the cases where the most benefits are available are for um, high worth clients charged with uh, very white collar crimes, um, people who have sometimes unlimited uh, resources to fund bail, uh, to secure um, private security, to enforce bail conditions, to pay huge financial settlements. Um, basically the kind of people we all want to represent. Um, there are, of course, other cases. Um, uh, unlike uh, Lisa and I think Eileen, I sometimes represent people who are, whose crimes are a little bit more down and dirty. Um, and some of the benefits of waiving extradition are not um, necessarily available to them. Um, uh, they're not an op they're not an option for the Russian hacker or uh, Nigerian money launderer or Chinese spy that I've represented who have the misfortune of, of being uh, arrested in Europe on an extradition warrant. That said, some of the other benefits, sentencing mitigation and that sort of thing, are still available um, if you waive extradition. So keeping all that in mind, um, under the right circumstances, what are the benefits for not waiving extradition, fighting extradition? Um, well, first and foremost, the obvious one, which is your client might actually win the extradition case uh, in, in the country of their arrest. And um, this requires a very close work and cooperation with the client's local extradition lawyers um, who uh, were hopefully your client has retained excellent uh, local representation, lawyers like the, my other, um, the other colleagues on the panel here, um, who are, of course, in the best position to determine whether, in this particular case, uh, there are um, reasons to believe that extradition is not going to be successful. It requires trust in, uh, in the local extradition attorneys um, to make sure that their interests and your client's interests are aligned. Um, and ideally, you have a very close collaborative relationship with those extradition lawyers. One other consideration, um, of course, is that even if your client wins the extradition fight in the country that they're arrested in, and that country does not extradite the person to the United States, it doesn't mean another country won't. Uh, and so if um, your, client also, your client also has to make the decision about whether they're willing to be marooned in the country uh, where they won the extradition fight, um, or whether they might as well go to the United States and face the music. Um, so that, of course, is the primary reason. There are some other reasons, um, strategic reasons, to consider uh, fighting extradition. Um, one is the possibility that a long extradition fight is going to extract uh, concessions from the United States. Um, some of you may know the case of uh, megaupload.com, 
um, about a decade, 15 years ago or so, the Eastern District of Virginia indicted um, uh, a colorful German entrepreneur named Kim.com, self-named, uh, <laughs> uh, who, who ran this, uh, one of the first sort of online um, cloud storage um, companies. He and other executives in that company were indicted for racketeering um, in uh, criminal copyright infringement, that sort of thing. And um, in a very public uh, show of force, and, um, law enforcement descended on his birthday party, which he was having in New Zealand at the time, and arrested him and the other executives of the company. Um, ten years later, they're still in New Zealand uh, because they um, engaged in a very long, distracted extradition fight. Um, and while Kim.com is still, at some point, probably going to be extradited, his senior executives um, worked out uh, deals recently, in the last year, 10 years after their arrest um, in New Zealand. They were released on bail in New Zealand, obviously, that, that's the only reason that worked. Um, it, it, where they have to, they, they accepted guilty pleas to very minor charges in New Zealand um, in exchange for the US dropping the extradition request entirely. Um, and that would never have happened uh, 10, 8, 5 years ago, but it was the length of time. Now, 10 years is obviously extreme, um, and the European lawyers on the panel will you know, be able to tell you what sort of the length uh, of an extradition um, proceeding may be in their respective countries. But um, again, lengthy waits can weaken their case. Um, witnesses can lose interest. Prosecutors who brought the charges to begin with leave the DOJ and go into private practice and attend conferences like this. Uh, so um, uh, there may be reasons to, to, to wait. Um, another instance um, may be that you know we're dealing with crimes that uh, are multinational in nature, um, and it may be possible to convince um, local prosecutors in the country where the client was arrested that uh, charges are violated there, um, and to bring charges in that um, in that country instead, so that. Uh, because you know the sentencing scheme may be much more favorable to your client in a country like Germany or Spain uh, rather than the United States, um, and if the person is prosecuted in that country instead, of, instead um, they may not be extradited for double, on double jeopardy ground. Um, another possibility that related is um, this is rare, but uh, it may be that another country is interested in bringing an extradition request, and if you wait long enough that extradition request will come in and the person will be extradited to that country as well. I, I, I represented the Russian hacker who was um, extradited, who was arrested in the Republic of Georgia to be extradited to New York. Um, and Russia uh, decided that perhaps they didn't want him to go to the United States um, and, 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 and uh, lodged an extradition request for him. Um, and he, of course, hoped that that request would prevail and he would go back to Russia instead, um, but Georgia, for I think political reasons, ultimately decided to extend him to, to New York, but um, there are instances where that can work. Um, and now just a couple of um, small um, sort of practical reasons. Um, if it's likely that your client is going to be fighting their case in the United States, that they're going to go to trial, that they're going to go all the way, sometimes um, it may make sense to prolong the extradition fight in, in the arresting country because uh, the U.S. is going to provide the prosecutors in that country with discovery uh, that may not be available to the defense in the United States, at least initially. So the extradition paperwork is, tends to be more comprehensive um, than the uh, Rule 16 discovery that you would get initially in the United States. Uh, in its efforts to help the prosecutors in the arresting countries, DOJ may be willing to reveal more than they would initially to the defense. Um, and so it's sort of a, um, an investigation uh, possibility. And lastly, um, as, as I think uh, Lisa mentioned, um, if your client is detained in the country that they're arrested in, and they're likely to serve a very long sentence in the United States once expedited, the conditions of confinement are a a major consideration. Um, it is, I think, generally more pleasant to be in jail in uh, some of the countries in Europe um, than it is in the United States. And if a person is going to go to the United States and serve a 10 or 20 or life sentence, 
um, but they spend the first two years fighting expedition in Spain, let's say, in, in more comfortable circumstances, that may be something that they are interested in doing. Um, so those are some of the reasons to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Well, Jeremy, since I, um, you are one of the excellent local council that deals with the individual when they get picked up on the extradition warrant, can you tell us how you advise your clients? Of course, thank you, Eileen. And even though Florian's idea about uh, disclosure convinced me, I, I will come back to, to Lisa's advantages probably. Well, we all agree probably that expeditions, uh, expedition proceedings are never a better of process, even less when the requesting state is that gorilla called the US or our solely missed EU partner called the UK. So most of my clients are American, British, Germans, okay, but basically uh, Americans and, and British, so the expedition is never, is never easy to challenge extradition. So once you study the extradition request and conclude with a worrying diagnosis, so I still have the Lisa's echoes here, you're gonna lose it. You are gonna lose it. <laughs> okay. Um, is it really worth fighting it? Does it actually make sense to delay the surrender knowing since the beginning, since the beginning, since the very first minute, that it's almost inevitable? From a fee perspective, I do not I do not have any doubt, absolutely, it does. But let's see in practice what's the best way to protect our client in terms of their interests. And by the way, his pocket, probably. I would say there is three main advantages. Um, first of all, unless you find a breach or a weak point in the extradition request, for example, with the US, I've seen many times uh, a lack of dual criminality. Basically, in offenses, uh, US offenses related to market and consumers, in Spain, I would say it's the same like running a red light or a parking ticket, okay? Those are not actually offenses in Spain, maximum administrative issues which of course the client is not going to face jail and therefore the extradition might be refused due to this lack of criminality. The key point in, in extradition cases, and I agree with uh, Lisa, is to obtain the requested person release um, as soon as possible. So if this is the scenario, one of the cards you could play in the bail hearing is exactly, precisely, the voluntary surrender in exchange of avoiding the pretrial detention. And I'm saying one of the cards, but probably it's your only chance, it's your only card, because the situation normally is a happy American or a happy British arriving on holiday to, my, to Mallorca, to Ibiza, to uh, Bilbao, Barcelona, Costa del Sol, without any roots in the country. And suddenly the DOJ publishing his webpage that there is a sealed case and once he's arrested there is an <coughs> indictment and he's facing 20 years jail or life imprisonment. Therefore, for every single public agent in Spain, meaning judge who is going to decide the pretrial detention or the prosecutor who is going to seek for this pretrial detention, he or she is a flight risk. And there is nothing you can do about it. And therefore, your only card, your best chance is to say, hey, what? If he consents, he stays home, he cannot leave the island, he cannot leave the city, uh, he gives your partner your passport, etc. Right? So, this is not automatic and it's not so easy. It depends on many factors, and no prosecutor will ever admit in public that this is possible. I'm saying, I can say, but I pro they probably won't. Um, but this, this, this is the main, the main idea. So just for this reason, I agree with Lisa that avoiding our clients months of custody in a foreign country, is it worth surrendering? So this is the first and main advantage. And then if we achieve this, which again, is not so simple, there will be two extra advantages which in my opinion are, are very interesting. Um, so he, has, he or she has been released, 
he or she is waiting to be surrendered, and therefore there's a second advantage in this scenario. If you know your onions and how Interpol works in cooperation with the Spanish court, you can try to manage your client flight tickets. They're going to be sort of a travel agent in Spain for your client and negotiate with the Interpol and the court when and how and in which seat is going to his or she is going to fly and even to avoid them spending the night at the police station the night before the flight being driven in a police car to the airport, to the airplane door and flying in handcuffs this is a great advantage I would say it's very comfortable for the requesting person to come back in proper conditions and on the other hand and lastly and in my experience okay, I, I know there are uh, public agents here and prosecutors so I don't want to generalize American prosecutors are keener to offer very reasonable <coughs> rich plays when they learn that the requested person is not in custody in the executing state. And therefore, as a part of this guilty plea, not being arrested upon arrival in the US and even getting a suspended sentence or fine are real possibilities which make the client very happy, of course. I'm not so I'm not so brave, believe me, as to try to enlighten American lawyers and prosecutors about plea bargains. So I will change topic and finish my, my contribution by explaining a real case that I saw very recently was Christmas uh, 2022, related to the requesting state was the U.S. Uh, was the, the, the southern district of the Department of Justice and was an FX market manipulation plus fraud. The client was facing exactly 20 years. He was in the UK, I was a South Africa national who landed in Spain and was arrested upon arrival. And he didn't consent to extradition. He was, of course, kept in custody. I appealed the decision and I was lucky the High Court with, uh, reversed the ruling and therefore he was facing the extradition uh, free, in freedom. But realistically, there were no merits or big grounds to be to have hope, and therefore we started negotiations to surrender. And at the end, we did this, and it was um, it was a milestone in, in Spain because we could choose even the dates to fly to New York. We even managed, together with the U.S. attorney to do the arrangement from the GFK uh, airport by video conference with the court it was the 22nd of December, something like this. And he could fly back the same day after the five minutes video conference arrangement to London to meet his kids in, in Christmas. Before, this uh, Disney movie script won't be possible, possible if the client is in custody, only because the client was free and therefore the US prosecutor were wondering why a guy who is facing 20 years in the US is not in custody in Spain and therefore it's uncertain for them and probably they are keener to offer to offer something right um, so even though it was the freedom was got in an, in an appeal I, I repeat I was lucky we could do this since the beginning by negotiating with the prosecutor and therefore for me these three advantages uh, are, are, are fair enough. Thank you very much. <coughs> how long, if you choose to fight extradition, how long can you stretch that out in Spain? Uh, well, it depends on the country. Mm -hmm. uh, now with the UK, under normal circumstances, it will be three months. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the US, it could take mm, between six months, one year, even one year and a half. Okay, so you couldn't have that situation where it goes on for 10 years and then and then the case is stale. If you, are, if you are very lucky and you appeal to the constitutional court with this very extraordinary uh, remedy and the rate of uh, success is only 1% and in this constitutional court you are so lucky to get precautionary measures, they would stop the surrender and therefore you can take 5, 6, 7 years. But it's one percent. Thank you. Um, Sorry, can you speak to the toolkit that you have available in Germany to fight extradition 
and also the um, extent to which German courts examine the conditions of confinement at foreign prisons. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a real privilege to speak to you today. Um, I'm specialized in, in extradition in Germany and to understand um, that a little bit better. And it's important to understand that Germany alone has 16 what we call Bundesländer, so that would be counties. Um, so these 16 counties have different uh, angles to jurisdiction and different, different, different levels of professionalism on the um, on their knowledge uh, on extradition cases. You will find courts such as Munich or Frankfurt, or the, uh, big airports, international airports, who are regularly working on extradition. But you will have other uh, uh, courts, we talked about Schleswig the other day, I mean, uh, <laughs> who don't have any borders near them, uh, so <laughs> they don't even know what extradition is about. <laughs> um, that just to give you an idea of the German situation. But it's important to me because today, with you as Americans, um, most of you, it's important to understand that not only Germany has 16 countries, uh, countries um, that have different angles, but obviously, if the US wants someone from, the, from, from Europe, well, what does that mean? That means you have a rep notice out there, someone flies in in Paris, someone flies in in Frankfurt, someone flies in in Copenhagen. Well, I'm happy I'm not in your position, in the DOJ position, because that must be so difficult, because you have 26 countries with various different uh, legal arrangements with the United States just on the basis of the extradition treaty. Um, so finding the legal basis is difficult enough as a starting point. But then, not only is the extradition treaty different <coughs> from country to country, but also the extradition law is completely different. If I look at uh, Rebecca, for example, I think that the procedure in the UK is so much more complicated and complex than it is in Germany. And um, I think your question before was how long does it take uh, to have an extradition process in Spain? I would say it's pretty similar in Germany um, if you're very lucky you can extend it to a year or a year and a half, possibly two years with constitutional court getting involved. But then uh, luck again is uh, slightly depending on how you uh, phrase it because contrary to Spain, Germany is very reluctant to release prisoners uh, in extradition cases. Um, I think particularly because I mean, they know that once people are out, there's so many, um, so many borders very nearby that it's very easy for people to flee into a different jurisdiction to start the whole procedure back again. It's very difficult for borders to Poland, Luxembourg, France, and so on. Very difficult to release some. And even if someone actually gets a verdict in Germany on his extradition case to the United States, well, even if you successfully defend someone, what does it mean? Well, if that person successfully defending extradition in Germany goes to France, which often is only a couple of kilometers away, there's no binding effect to the extradition decision from Germany. So the whole thing starts back again. I think Rebecca and I, in a paper, calculated that this will get you uh, easily into two years of prison, just waiting for the extradition papers if you take all the European tour as a defendant. Um, you can not only see all the different prisons, but you can actually spend quite a lot of time um, there because there is no binding effect uh, in general. Um, importantly, you have different prison conditions in the various countries, and I'll come to that in a second. But for example, if you are apprehended in Romania, you will face completely different uh, situations in prison than you will find them, for example, let's say Sweden or Denmark. Um, so this will put you in a slightly different position in terms of whether you want to waive your extradition or not, because obviously in Denmark, well, it's comfortable in a sense, uh, maybe nicer than in New York prison, uh, while in Romania or as a, we all know, for example, in Croatia, you might want to uh, waive your extradition pretty quickly in order to avoid um, very bad conditions. So in essence, um, it's extremely difficult um, to, to give you one answer on this because you've got so many different levels um, of jurisdiction, so many different legal angles to this. 
And to make it even more complicated, um, we have a judgment by the European Court of Justice uh, from 28th of October from last year, which describes the influence of um, not only the national versus US treaties, extradition treaties, but also sets it into context of the European and American Treaty on uh, uh, Extradition, which was um, enacted shortly after 9-11, um, but um, which really gives you kind of the umbrella treaty for extradition for all European countries. And it, the European Court didn't really make it easy because they say, well, not only do we have to take local standards into account, we don't have to take the National Extradition Treaty into account, but we also have to take into account the European um, fundamental rights. Um, so here we go, that's uh, your legal source number three. Um, and that's not enough, because we also have the fundamental uh, principles um, and fundamental rights enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and that is something I think that we all have a common standing on, whether it's Spain, whether it's the UK, they actually even abide to that right still. Uh, but according to the papers, it could, this could actually change tomorrow. So, um, but this European uh, Convention on Human Rights obviously gives you the standards. Um, it actually has um, a provision in there for a double jeopardy, um, something that I'm personally highly involved in and, and um, that I've been working on for the last couple of years. And to make a long story short, while, um, as it was described before, um, some people were only able to spend their uh, liberty within a certain country, such as if you're a German citizen, Germany doesn't extradite its own nationals. So you can actually spend your time in Germany. Um, but if you travel to France, you get arrested and set in a plane if you're not here. Um, now that has changed somewhat because at least for the cases of double jeopardy, the European Court has ruled uh, in two rulings from uh, 2021 and October 2022 that um, double jeopardy applies between all European countries. So if your client has been uh, sentenced or acquitted in one European country, um, this will give him the liberty not only to have his freedom within Switzerland as we heard before, or to spend uh, the time in what I call the golden cage in Germany, so between the mountains, the Alps, and the North Sea, if you have been to the North Sea, it's not the Isa, it's not, <laughs> it's not the Nova. Uh, so you do want to get to Spain at some point. And if you don't want to end up with Heimer, you, um, you better get uh, a judgment by European court actually confirming that the US indictment relates to the same set of facts that were subject to your conviction in another European jurisdiction. And if you have that, you should be able to take it <coughs> as a carte blanche, as a free travel pass uh, to at least go to all other European countries. So that is uh, a very uh, exceptional thing uh, that double jeopardy is recognized as, a, as an obstacle to extradition, not only in one country, but in all other European jurisdictions as well. So that could be one defense that we could raise in the exhibition. Another one, prison conditions. And this is something that, well, Rebecca don't blame me. Um, but, um, you know, even the prison conditions in this particular city, London, are as poor and as, well, contrary to human rights, that the German court recently found that it to be necessary to declare that we don't wish to to London in order to find the the human rights, uh, basic human rights being upheld in London uh, prisons because of the overcrowding, for example, in the one was prison here um, near London. Um, so what I'm saying here is this applies to the United Kingdom. We have a, uh, even after Brexit, we have a mutual trust and recognition. We have a very simplified surrender mechanism from Germany, from all over Europe to the United Kingdom. Um, still, Germans, uh, find it necessary to declare that British prisons are all right in terms of human rights. So I wonder if we hear about New York prisons, when is a uh, first court in Germany or in Europe uh, actually uh, complaining about prison conditions there? And Heinrich called it the gorilla. 
um, I'd say the big brother, but obviously uh, it is a quite a challenge for a European court to say and to claim that the United States doesn't meet um, human rights standards. So I'm not too confident that this, this day will come. Um, just to give you some short other buzzwords for the uh, defense against extradition, uh, apart from double jeopardy, apart from um, prison uh, conditions, I think what's worth looking at is always the fair trial argument because what you call plea bargaining um, would uh, be something that the German constitutional court, at least at local standards, has held to be unconstitutional if there's too much of a discrepancy between the sentence with the guilty plea and without the guilty plea. That's just a very recent case that we might bring up the topic again of a, a former Audi um, CEO, Stadler, who pled guilty to two years with a clear sentence by the court. Well, you can go to prison and you can plead guilty. Uh, if you do uh, plead guilty, it's only two years on probation, and you'll be fine. Uh, he might take this topic to the courts again. Another one that used to be quite interesting, but I think the argument has become somewhat more difficult, is life without parole. Um, I uh, don't know if you're familiar with the judgment of, in the case of Sanchez and Sanchez, where, uh, against the United uh, Kingdom from 3rd November of 2022. Um, there was a uh, judgment before that, I think it was in Pinto, right, was it? Um, uh, claiming that there had to be a clear perspective of release in uh, the other, uh, in the requesting state. But according to Sanchez and Sanchez, any kind of possibility of release, basically, such as a presidential pardon, should be enough. So it's going to be very difficult to argue um, life without parole or uh, gross disproportionate sentence in US cases. I think that was. Yes, sir, I actually have a, a question about double jeopardy. And, and for the Americans who are here and everyone else, we're used to uh, apparently a very unusual concept compared to the rest of the world where we see double jeopardy referring to the same sovereign prosecuting twice. And we consider different sovereigns have different interests and they can, they can prosecute the same thing. So for example, while it's unusual, um, it's not double jeopardy if let's say the state of New York prosecutes someone for a crime, and then the federal government does the same thing. This happened quite a lot, um, particularly with the southern states um, years ago, when very often, um, let's say, a, a, a white person had murdered black people and um, out of racial hatred, and southern white juries might acquit, but the federal government would come in with civil rights charges, and the federal government would convict that person for the very same acts. And that's justified as, well, there, there are two different sovereigns. One is the state, and one is the federal government. And now, Soren, what, what you've described with double jeopardy is basically if any sovereign in the, first of all, any sovereign in the EU um, has prosecuted somebody, um, Germany will not extradite because um, double jeopardy attaches. They will not attribute to the United States. Is that correct? Yes. And the, the fundamental principle behind it is uh, actually that um, you know if you've been convicted in a European country, you can't be prosecuted and convicted for the same offence in another European country. The question was really: Is extradition? Is the running of an extradition proceeding is that contributing to a uh, to another? Uh, conviction, yes or no, and the European Court said you can't differentiate between actually prosecuting it out of your own right as France, for example, or running an extradition case uh, as France to the United States. So effectively, they are saying. But there's one more thing, I mean, if I may, on that one, because, um, and this really gives, I think, an interesting angle to this, because to my understanding, at least from the uh, US perspective, um, I think it's Gamble uh, against the United States um, ruling by the Supreme Court, which makes it very difficult because uh, under Gamble, um, you cannot, in the US, um, apply double jeopardy 
to uh, in case of a foreign judgment, because that's irrelevant, if I may say so, for, from the US perspective. Um, so effectively, the US side cannot give any valid assurance on not prosecuting, because such a servant would be contrary to the law, uh, and contrary to the Supreme Court rulings. So you're left with a very difficult uh, situation from our perspective. Have you had any success with, um, let's say, a client, whether they're a German national or a national of another EU country, and the potential sentence in the US is very harsh? Have, have you considered having that person, assuming that the crime affected a European country, have you had success um, getting that person prosecuted in the EU, getting a light sentence, and then acting as a bar to extradition? No, I, I don't. Personally, I, I, I don't like this kind of forum shopping uh, I idea. I understand the point, but I think, um, you know, this whole idea of double jeopardy relies on the principle of mutual trust and recognition. So, and there is bars to the like, minimum standards under the rule of Kosovsky uh, by the European Court of Justice as to what really triggers um, uh, double jeopardy within Europe and what creates this mutual trust and recognition. So, if you just go to, sorry to, to you, well, if you go to country R, for example, <laughs> in Europe, Climate doesn't know what I'm talking about. Uh, the Southeastern European uh, countries, and you try to get a, a very cheap sentence, um, it will, <coughs> in my view, that this minimum standard will probably not be met. So you, you can't, you don't have safety for your clients anyway. It's like gaming the system, so that's not respected. Yeah. Uh, now, Rebecca, I want to ask you about a case that was in the news very recently, your client. Zhang Li. Um, can you tell um, the audience today about that case, which I think is quite interesting? Um, yeah, that, it was a really interesting uh, case where the <coughs> facts were very much in favour of um, cooperating kind of early on. Um, so that is um, what we did. And I think the engagement with US lawyers from the very um, <coughs> was really crucial. Um, and in fact, it was because of that engagement that we were able to get bail. So obviously, as Lisa was saying, bail is something you'll be thinking about bail in the US right at the beginning. But uh, when you've got a client in custody in the UK, their primary consideration is going to be, am I going to get bail here? And um, the UK, Recently, there has been it has become more difficult to get bail in extradition proceedings. So the law says that there is a presumption in favour of bail if you haven't been convicted of something in extradition, as in um, other criminal matters. But the reality in extradition cases, and perhaps it's because there will often be uh, a suggestion of flight, um, is that you will always be subject to a very strict set of bail conditions, which are kind of predetermined. So you will have to surrender your passports, uh, will not apply for international travel documents, you'll have to abide by a curfew, and um, so on and so forth. But the, the uh, sticking point is um, the bail security the bond that you have to pay. Um, which applies totally regardless, really, of what your um, financial means are. And so if you're very poor um, and you're arrested on an extradition request, it would be hard to get bail. But a problem in, in that case, actually, was that he was, he was too rich. <laughs> and so the court was unable to find a figure that was you know, meaningful to him. Um, and they set bail at 50 million in the end, which I think is the, the second highest. Um, and went through this strange and a bit arbitrary process of, we said, how about 10 million? And the judge said, oh, I think 15 million. Um, and that's, uh, that's how we got to that figure. Um, but because, because of that, he also um, had 
even stricter bail conditions than um, was is usual. I think it's a first case. I think it is more common in other jurisdictions. I think we do have it in the US that he was subject to house arrest, actually 24-hour house arrest, um, where he was um, he had two people inside his flat, which was on the 40th floor, two people outside his flat monitoring people who came in. He had a CCTV camera in his bedroom, which uh, actually wasn't imposed by the court, but you know, it's very intrusive. And then two people wandering around outside, and he had to pay something like $400,000 a month to this um, security firm for the pleasure of, um, of keeping him detained in that way. So you can imagine that uh, after a while, uh, that, <laughs> that sort of stick stuck in his, uh, in his throat a bit. Um, but he, he eventually um, negotiated um, a really good um, deal where he um, flew back to, to California. Unfortunately, he had to fly back um, on a normal flight. He was <laughs> the US always was trying hard to persuade the, the OIA to go with the uh, uh, private jet. Um, but um, in the end, they all went back. Economy class <laughs> was uh, quite amusing for those who weren't on the flight. Um, but um, he, he went back to the US, signed a DPA there, and then flew off on his private jet the next day back to, to China, um, having agreed yeah, a, a really great deal with the corporate um, pleaded guilty, and and that was that was the end of the case. I mean, the, um, just funnily enough, this past week I have been dealing with the the Florian uh, type of case actually, um, <laughs> um, where our client has been fighting extradition now since 2011. It's my longest running case, and uh, we were notified a couple of weeks ago that the Secretary of State had decided to, to order his extradition. Um, and so we are in the process of preparing our kind of final challenge to that. But, and that is looking at suicide risk, which is a, a really live issue and in, in the CJU at the moment as well. Uh, but that is, uh, uh, there are no other cases like that at the moment. And how is it that um, Zhang faced such um, onerous conditions of release. You know, one would think, you know, that's because of his risk of flight, because, and one would flee because of a heavy sentence. And yet, at the same time, you negotiate a deferred prosecution agreement so he could come to California, basically be guilty, and live happily ever after, and that's it. Yeah, it was very difficult to understand. And, um, you know why it happened, or what the forces I, were? Yeah, I do know why it happened. And it, it was because the judge um, saw a case that he imagined to be like... So it, it was because of the wealth of the client. Um, uh, it, he imagined it to be a much bigger case than it was. Um, I think it was from it was um, the, the U.S. lawyers were saying this. This is a case that shouldn't have been charged, um, really. So again, an exceptional case, and not one of those cases that you that you come across very often. So they had a very strong negotiating hand, but the, the judge was just blinded by, you know, you know, he's a billionaire, he's got a private jet. There also, it was an extradition request from the US, but the client was Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, and so the judge, that was a very um, important factor for the judge's consideration, that he could go to China and be safe from extradition there, regardless of the fact that, that our client was an international businessman and um, you know, needed to leave China um, in order to conduct his significant business. So interesting. Have, have you ever had a situation um, with a UK citizen um, who has been sought for extradition, and can you sort of 
game the system by having the person plead to a similar crime in, in the UK? Yeah, we have, we've tried it, um, but we have never been successful. And so in, um, in 2013, there was um, the introduction of a new bar to extradition called the Forum Bar, which came about um, because the, the, the issue of UK and US extraditions is incredibly, has this great traction, even though it doesn't uh, politically have great traction, even though it doesn't affect a huge number of people. But it will regularly make the newspapers that the US-UK extradition um, treaty is imbalanced. And the reason um, for that is that um, under the treaty, requests submitted by the UK to the US have to satisfy the probable cause test, um, whereas um, the, the other way around, it's just a uh, reasonable suspicion. Um, my view, and, and the view of, of uh, others who have spent time thinking about it, is that there isn't that much difference between probable cause and reasonable suspicion. They're all based on reasonableness, but um, I think, the, I think the, the reason for that misperception is, is that the US has a very, very long um, territorial reach. Um, and so, yeah, so in 2013, um, the Forum Bar was introduced. Um, it introduced a, a two-step test where um, you have to look at whether a substantial amount of the activity was um, performed in the UK. And then if the answer is yes, then you go on to look at whether it's in the interest of justice. There are seven specified matters for the court to consider. Um, and that isn't just a, a US bar. Um, but it has been successful in respect of um, three cases um, so far. Um, and in all of those cases, UK prosecutions haven't actually taken place. And I think it's, um, I think it's because, um, the, well, it, it's for lots of reasons. One of, it, one of them is the resourcing problems of bodies here, but another problem is that it's it's culturally very um, unknown really to take over prosecutions, to transfer proceedings, like in other countries, European jurisdictions, um, you would have transfer of proceedings, but we don't need it here. And do you, um, and I'm addressing this to, to the entire panel, um, do your citizens have a right to serve out their prison sentence in your home country. <coughs> Sorry, um, there isn't a right, um, but there are prison transfer agreements with lots of countries, and it is possible <coughs> to get people back. The arrangements with the EU are, are more difficult now. It used to be very easy across the EU, but um, yeah, since, since we left, and I'm, I'm glad that you missed us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jaime, the situation in Spain? Yeah, as Rebecca was saying, it's, it's not uh, difficult. And uh, before with the UK, it was a simple motion, a three lines motion, and was actually fast, not quick, but now it's getting, it's getting more complicated. Um, Soren, uh, do German citizens uh, who've been x rayed have the right to serve their time in Germany? They don't necessarily have a right, but they can, they can request for a transfer. But uh, obviously, due to a very different um, sentencing regime in the United States, this puts us into very big difficulties because Germany is a paradise in that sense. And our lifelong prison is 15 years. That's one five one five zero. Um, uh, so anything above that, um, you need explicit consent uh, by the person to spend a lot of time. If I, if I may, I just recall my last game in Sweden was months ago. You see, you have not many chances and the uh, requested person is, was a British national requested by Sweden for fraud and forgery. You can arise a topic to the extradition court and say, listen, in case you agree to extradition, uh, put the condition to Sweden that he has the right to come back. And if the car does, 
he can come back and he came back and was in Spain a suspended sentence and in Sweden we were probably in prison time. I mean, I, I, was, I was a prosecutor for many years um, and, and I recall a number of times when somebody might get a sentence of say five years and when they were allowed to serve the sentence in their home country, they only spent say six months and then they got out on probation. Um, one question else I want to address to, to all of you. Um, again, having been on the prosecution side for most of my extraditions, um, I found that it's as much um, a political as a judicial process in that um, in the United States, if you wanted to extradite someone to the U.S., you not only had to get consent from our Department of Justice, but the Secretary of State of the United States had to sign off as well. And the reason for that is that some extradition requests might implicate delicate foreign relations matters. Has that occurred in any of your cases specifically, whether it's the United States or Minister of Justice of your or a different country? Or, maybe, or I should say, sec um, a foreign secretary. If I may, yes. in, in the European arrest warrant system, this doesn't apply, but in extradition, you mean the consent of the Ministry of Justice, which is in the 99.9 .9 of the cases, automatical. Mm -hmm. But there is some, as you, as you said, some uh, delicate uh, cases where they might say, like for some I recall Falciani uh, to Switzerland, they might say, hey, listen, I bind the judicial decision. And it's, of course, it's political. Actually, with China, we had a lot of uh, extradition cases before, like in 2014. The courts were uh, agreeing to extradition, but the Chinese government complained. You know, there's very strong economic relations between Spain and China, and therefore, what the government did after some refusal was to absolutely change, reform the law. <laughs> the ongoing cases were wrong. Has anyone else had political considerations interfere or benefit uh, your extradition cases? It, it's interesting, in, in my Andrew Pierce case, uh, very recently, the Mozambican finance minister was extradited by South Africa to the United States. And just a little background there, um, the Mozambique finance minister does not live in South Africa. He just happened to be there. And the South Africans arrested him on competing extradition requests, one from the United States and one from Mozambique. Well, Mozambique obviously is in the same continent as South Africa, and there was a real political tension for the South Africans. Do we extradite him to Mozambique, or the United States may be a more important ally for us? And so the United States request ultimately prevailed, um, and it was a real political Hustle there, and I think the interesting facet from my perspective is the Mozambique finance minister has spent five years in a South African prison, and I would think, well, for God's sakes, any United States lawyer would cut a deal immediately for time served. I mean, how much more time does the guy have to do? And it was explained to me that the United States can't just roll over because South Africa really extended itself, screwing Mozambique for the benefit <laughs> of the states. And if they, if the states just gives them a walk, well, it doesn't look good for the South Africans vis-a-vis -vis their neighbor. Um, I thought that was very interesting. Very interesting. I'd like to open it up for questions to our panelists. Please raise your hand if you have a question. I can. Uh, I can answer uh, on the political position. Oh, yes. <laughs> we'll do that, and then we'll get the question back there. So um, it is a really interesting question, because the, the structure of extradition changed completely 20 years ago um, in 2003 with the Extradition Act, which aimed very much to take uh, decision-making away from the politicians. Uh, and so um, the only... Uh, decision making that the Secretary of State for the Home Department still had up until 2013 when it was removed was this final um, uh, appeal 
um, in something involving persons human rights. So that's the case that I'm dealing with at the moment, and that stayed with the Secretary of State since that time. But the the impact actually of taking away the Secretary of State's decision making is that um, it has it means that she has very little discretion to refuse cases which are clearly obviously political. So um, there are a number of Russian extradition requests, for example, which are often politically motivated, which um, she has an obligation to certify, um, but um, does not, uh, she defers endlessly certifying them as a, as a means to get around the fact that her, her jurisdiction and her sense has been removed. And what happens to the individuals who run it from Russia? Are they out on bail generally? The extradition, they're never arrested. They're never they're arrested. arrested. They know, often they know, because of, they, they know what's going on in Russia, yeah. that an extradition request has been sent. But they are here, often with a red notice as well, just living their everyday lives. I mean, which will be more difficult if there's a public red notice, because they won't be able to access banking and so on. But, but yeah, they just... Um, there's a lot of things. Really interesting. I saw a hand raised in the back here. Yes. Would you stand up, please? It's you. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's a question for me for the story of the family. Um, uh, despite the um, recent efforts by one inmate from Wandsworth Prison to address the overcrowding position <laughs> by escaping on the bottom of the case of the trap, um, <laughs> to what extent do you think the recent decision of the German court about human rights conditions in English prisons are going to affect extraditions more widely from the EU or indeed any other jurisdictions in the UK? I think the, the simple answer is you have to look at which court this is coming from. This is a court of South West Germany, a yeah. very nice, very nice wine region. Um, <laughs> city of Karlsruhe. This court is, is known for its very liberal mind um, and this I think was a well defended uh, person. Um, I don't think this is going to be the, the general standard. Um, there is also in the media quite a lot of uh, attention on UK prison conditions at the moment. The riots and rats and everything that can happen in the prisons, obviously. Um, but um, I don't think this is going to be your concern. On the 19th of September, I, I had a hearing. An extradition hearing of the Western state of the UK, my clients and Irish national. And I'm analyzing this topic and I'm saying, hey, prison conditions are very bad where I have my fingers crossed. But you know, in Spain in Spain the extradition courts are really specialized. And therefore Spain sending uh, prisoners to El Salvador, Brazil, wherever so <laughs> The faces of the three judges were like, well, that's very interesting. You know, and then I said, by the way, Kazwood, I'm like, what, Kazwood? <laughs> so, we will see. I, I, I keep hope, but uh, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a real argument for the special. I saw a hand here. Thanks. Um, so, I'm Especially with respect to people who might have a resolution of charges somewhere in the EU. And I think I heard you say before that there's not going to be forum shopping and defendants can't expect to get sort of a cheap resolution somewhere in Europe to avoid extradition to the US. But I'm, I'm still curious um, if, if anyone has yet tested that ECJ ruling, meaning if someone gets what I would say, a legitimate resolution, say on a hacking charge, with some EU state, and is being sought by the US on that charge. Have, have we yet seen anyone, any defendant, in possession of a resolution in Europe who travels within Europe without the fear of extradition? I did, but um, it's not, let's say, it must be the same facts, it must be very clear, which is never easy, that the request is exactly for the same facts at the same time, at the very moment, because otherwise 
if there is a multi jurisdictional issue, they can say no, but the ruling is not covering exactly everything, or it's very generic, it's very vague, it's unspecific, and therefore we found the window. So, for example, uh, Florian, uh, uh, there was no, sorry, sorry, was saying it might be considered form shopping. For example, with, with Germany, what we tend to do sometimes when two German partners uh, fight in, in Spain, and therefore they have, you have the perpetrator of a financial crime and victim, so they were a very close friend before. You know that the facts were in Spain because the villa or the company was based in Spain, but they are both Germans, and therefore Germany might have to restriction. They have, actually, but Spain too, because it's a form of the victim. The facts happen in Spain. Therefore, if we know the, the victim is hired lawyers already, and they are preparing a case in Germany, and they will even if you're in Europe and the world to avoid the tension, what, what I normally recommend is to self-report in a Spanish court, so we create a case. Spain won't be so lenient than the other jurisdictions, but we have a, a better window than, or better perspective than in Germany. In this case, which is very clear that this is exactly the same facts, he will be free to go wherever he wants in the European Union, but in complex cases, where maybe one fact is out of the ruling of the judgment, I will not risk it, I will not recommend the client, hey, let's do a round trip in the European Union because this has binding effects. And this, I, I think it's very difficult to find. The, 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 I think the core of the issue is that in the ruling of 12 May 2021, the European Court requested from the member states to introduce a procedure whereby you could actually really get a, a paper decision final and binding decision by European Court um, exactly on this point, on the identity of facts. So only if another court by a European member state would declare that the US indictment, the indictment actually reflects exactly the same fact as the European conviction, only then would you be free to travel. Well, the issue is no European country has such procedure whereby you just go and ask Dear court, can you tell me that this indictment is the same set of facts as what I'm, you know, I've been convicted of or acquitted of in another European country? Well, what's going to happen? The judge is going to say, like, are you here? No. Is there an extradition request? I don't know. Well, why should I bother dealing, looking at your case, comparing it to a very complex US matter? It's, um, no one wants to deal with that um, uh, voluntarily. And the European countries, obviously, don't give it a priority because what are you effectively doing? You are effectively protecting uh, convicted individuals from being prosecuted another time. That's not so popular, is it? So uh, uh, this is why no one is really taking care of this matter uh, by now. We have other questions. Yeah, thank you. I have a question um, about the FIFA soccer case. Um, in that case, um, Lisa, there was um, a defendant who was cooperating for Zaka, um, and he was facing extradition to the United <coughs> States. Um, do you know how the judge, uh, Pamela Chen, resolved his case? Yes. Um, it was really memorable because one of the few cases where the judge got very choked up at the sentence. So, I mean, by all accounts, she was practically crying. And um, this is one of the cases in your material, and we included it because she made such dramatic statements about the courage of Brazaco in cooperating. And just to back up, the point of my right, Argentina. Yes. If Brazaco, um, Rosalco, I think, was out for almost 10 years through the cooperation process, and he never could return from to Argentina, apparently, because he would have been murdered had he returned. He had been at the highest levels of the soccer bribery scandals, and effectively, by cooperating, was saying goodbye to his homeland. He testified in at least two trials, and notwithstanding the fact that he had been up to his eyeballs in these scandals, he ended up getting a sentence of time served. 
and is now free. And what I commend to you in the material is, and I referred to this earlier, was both the prosecution and Judge Chen in full-throated rhetoric delivered the message. If you are a foreign national, our United States judicial system, know this, will reward you for doing the right thing. And the people that do the right thing are going to get sentences like Mr. Brasacco, which is time served. Um, it was, it's very moving material, not just from Judge Chin, but the prosecutor um, extolled um, at length uh, Rosako's courage and how he deserved to be rewarded. So it's it's great reading material. I highly just, recommend it. Just as a afterward on that case, um, Judge Chen just recently dis, uh, dismissed the conviction or con overturned the convictions of the most recent FIFA defendants who were convicted based entirely almost on Rosako's testimony. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if he still felt exactly the same way after that. All right. Um, seeing no more questions, I want to thank you for your attentiveness. This is. I want to thank the panelists. This has been a very enlightening discussion. So thank you all. And thank you.